Assalamu alaikum and good day to all. So let's continue from our last lesson. Today we're going to look at how to solve some problems related to moving shock waves. Before we continue, I want to summarize what we've done last time, which is on the technique to solve the moving shock wave problem. Basically, what we have to do is we have to change the reference frame of the problem to make the shock stationary in the new frame. This process can be divided into four steps as labeled here as steps A, B, C, and D. In A, we have the original problem in the gas frame. In this step, we have to be clear what the problem is and what is it that we need to solve. Next, in step B, we change the frame into the shock frame, making it stationary. In step C, which is still in the same shock frame, we are now ready to solve the problem. We just need to redefine the velocities in terms of their Mach numbers so that we can use the stationary normal shock table or the SNS table to find all the parameters across the shock. Once we've calculated all the parameters in this frame, we can switch back to the original gas frame. That's done here in step D. In this original frame, we can find some remaining parameters to complete our solution. For example, we can find V2, which is the actual velocity of the flow behind the shock. Since we're going to be using the stationary shock table a lot, let's have a look at it again. In this table, we have a list of parameters that define the flow properties upstream and downstream of a stationary shock. Across the shock, a supersonic flow with a Mach number of M1 will instantaneously decelerate into a subsonic flow with a Mach number of M2. Across the shock, the flow will also be compressed into a higher pressure with a pressure ratio P2 over P1, a temperature ratio T2 over T1, and so on, as shown in this list. You can use the table to relate any of these parameters to one another. If given M1, which is usually the case, you can find the rest of the other parameters downstream of the shock. Or, if you're given M2, or any one of the property ratios, you can find M1 and the other parameters. In a sense, you can use a table to quote-unquote cross the shock. I'll be using this term a lot in this class, which means to relate the flow properties across the shock. In the standard stationary shock table for a supersonic flow, M1 ranges from 1 to 5 only. Beyond M equals to 5, the flow starts to become hypersonic and starts to behave differently. The gas molecules start to break apart in a process called dissociation. The electrical charges between the molecules start to occur in a process called ionization. When this happens, the assumptions that we used earlier to define how the gas behaves are no longer valid. For example, the air is no longer a perfect gas. Therefore, we cannot use this stationary shock table for flows with Mach numbers greater than 5. But, the topic of hypersonic flows is beyond the scope of our class, so we won't be dealing with any problems related to it. Let's look at problem 1. A shock wave propagates down a constant area duct into stagnant air at a pressure of 101.3 kPa and a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. If the pressure ratio across a shock wave is 3, find the shock speed and the velocity of the air downstream of the shock. The answers are given next to the question. So, how do we solve this problem? First, we'll use the three-step approach to break the problem apart into three phases. Number one, finding the purpose of the problem by having a clear understanding of what it is asking. Number two, set up a strategy on how to solve it and listing out what equations we'll use. And number three, apply our strategy to solve the problem. For this problem, our strategy is to basically change its reference frame. We'll see afterward that our strategy is quite straightforward and we can solve this problem directly. We'll compare this direct approach with an indirect approach in our second problem later. To have a clear understanding, we'll draw a diagram of the problem. Basically, we have a straight tube with a shock inside it moving towards the left. It's moving into region 1 and sweeping off the air it leaves behind in region 2 with a slower speed moving in the same direction. The given parameters are shown in green, V1, P1, T1 and the pressure ratio P2 over P1 across the shock. The unknown parameters are shown in red. The question is asking us to find U sub S and V2 
but we also don't know what P2 and T2 are. Next, we need to convert the frame into the shock frame. In this new frame, the shock is not moving, written as U sub S prime equals zero. Relative to the shock, the flow in region 1 is moving towards the right at a supersonic speed. Its V1 prime can be written as shown here. Because V1 equals to 0, V1 prime equals to U sub S. After the flow crosses the shock, it becomes subsonic and compressed with higher pressure, temperature and density. V2 prime equals to U sub S minus V2. At this point, we don't know these values. So, how do we solve this problem? What's our next strategy? We need some information to cross the shock. In a conventional simple problem, we are normally given the value of U sub S that shows how strong the shock is. In this problem, we don't have that information. In fact, we're given a different information that tells us how strong the shock is. It's the pressure ratio, P2 over P1. With this value, we can look up the stationary shock table and we can find M1 prime and 2 prime and T2 over T1. Finally, we can use the values we got from the table to find the other unknowns. Use M1 prime to find V1 prime, which gives you U sub S. Find P2 and T2 from the property ratios. Use M2 prime to find V2 prime which finally gives you V2. So that's it, problem solved. In problem two, a normal shock wave propagates down a constant area tube into stagnant air at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. Find the velocity of the shock wave if the air behind the wave is accelerated to Mach 1.2. We'll break this problem in three steps. Number one, purpose. Number two, strategy. And number three, solution. Okay, let's start with finding our purpose. Here we have a straight tube with a moving shock inside. The air properties in region 1 are given. Unfortunately, we don't know the strength of the shock either in terms of its shock speed U sub S or any property ratios such as P2 over P1 or T2 over T1. On the other hand, we know what happens after the flow crosses the shock. We're given that the flow Mach number behind the shock in the gas frame is 1.2. Our purpose is to find how strong the shock is in terms of its actual velocity in the gas frame. Our next step is to set up a strategy. The first thing to do is to change the frame into the shock frame. We need to rewrite the velocities of the flow in both regions. V1 prime equals to U sub S and V2 prime equals to U sub S minus V2. Next, we need to convert the velocities into their Mach numbers, M1 prime and M2 prime. Unfortunately, we don't have the values of any of these parameters, except for T1 and the constants gamma and R. Without any parameters to tell us how strong the shock is, we cannot cross the shock to find the rest of the other parameters in region 2. In a way, we cannot solve this problem directly. So, we have to come up with a new strategy to solve this problem. Simply put, if we cannot solve it directly, we may be able to solve it indirectly. One way to do this is to solve this problem by trial and error, by guessing what the strength of the shock is. Here, we can choose any one of the parameters listed in the shock table. For example, we can guess M1 prime, M2 prime or any of the property ratios to start our calculation. What's important is that at the end of our calculation, M2 has to be equal to 1.2 as given in the problem. If not, that means our guess is wrong. So we need to repeat the same process again by guessing a different value of the parameter that we've chosen at the start. This whole repetitive process is called an iterative process. One easy way to do this is by guessing M1 prime. Then use the stationary shock table to find M2 prime and T2 over T1. With those values, you can find U sub S, V2 prime, and finally M2. The most important thing in this iterative process is that you have to carefully choose the starting point of your first guess. 
Also, you need to have a clever, systematic way of choosing the second guess, third guess, fourth, and so on. Also, you need a systematic way of making your repetitive process converge quickly to the solution. There are many ways of doing this properly, but it's beyond our scope here, so I'll let you explore that on your own.